I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me then depart. No tongue can bid me then depart. When Satan tempts me to despair, and tells me of the kill within of what I look and see him there who made an end of all my sin because a sinless Savior died my sinful soul is counted free for God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me, to look on him and pardon me. Behold him there, the risen lamb, my perfect spotless righteousness, the great and changeable I am. The King of glory and of grace. One with himself, I cannot die. My soul is purchased by his blood. My life is hid with Christ on I, With Christ my Savior and my God. With Christ my Savior and my God. Because a sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on Him and pardon me, to look on Him and Now is the time to worship. Come. Now is the time to give your heart. Come. Just as you are to worship. Just as you are before your God, come. One day every tongue will confess you are God. One day every knee will bow. Still the greatest treasure remains for those who gladly choose you. Now is the time to worship. Come. Now is the time to give your heart. Come. Just as you are to worship. Oh, come. Just as you are. the time to worship. Come. 
now is the time to give your heart. Come, just as you are to worship. Oh, come, just as you are before your God. Oh, we come. Lord, open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Make that your prayer. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you, to see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love, as we say holy, 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 open the eyes, open the eyes of my heart, Lord Jesus. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? One thing I have asked of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple, Father, You are holy, God. You are holy, holy, holy. Lord, sometimes we think these songs are repetitive, but when we are struck with the majesty of who you are, 
it just we just want to repeat who you are because it can't express. We want to get there. We want our words to elevate and get there, but they never will. No matter how many times we repeat them or say them, God, you are holy, holy, holy. That's why the angels are before your throne right now saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, the one who is, who was, and is, and is to come. And it never gets old. And I pray it would never get old in our life. When it gets old in our life, it's because we have lost the right perspective of heaven. God, may you give us that perspective this morning. I pray, God, that you would grant this morning that your spirit would be here amongst us, Lord God, that we could, we could know your presence this morning. God, that you would meet with sinners. God, that you would restore us, that you would redeem us. God, that you would lead us. God, that you would use us for your kingdom in this world. God, in this place for such a time as this, you've called us to be here and to know you and to walk with you and to do something. God, and I pray that we would. And I pray it wouldn't be in our own strength. God, would you fill us with your strength? Would you fill this place with the truth, the resounding truth of your word this morning? And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. Go ahead and turn and greet one another. Say hello to somebody. Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Morning. Welcome to Calvary San Mateo. We're so glad you're here. We are excited to uh, be in the Lord's house this morning, be gathered together, and uh uh, Jeff is sick this morning, so we uh, just wanted to go through uh, just a few announcements. We usually do the announcements at 10 a.m. sharp uh, before worship, typically. We also have the Connect Center out in the foyer, so you could uh, get up to speed. And we also have a website that needs to be updated. But um, we have a few announcements this morning is uh, <clears throat> women's ministry is starting back up on June 19th. And they're going through this book, uh, Tell Someone by Greg Laurie. It kind of fits with the theme of John and just the theme of, of what the Lord's been uh, doing in our church, that we would not contain the goodness of God and the gospel. It is actually why we're left on earth is to tell someone the good news of Christ because, uh, let's just face it, we live in a world full of bad news. Um, so this is uh, going to be happening for the women, uh, June 19th at the church, 7 p.m. More information in the back at the Connect Center. And uh, next announcement, uh, tonight actually is the first Sunday of June, so we're having Exalt at 5 p.m., uh, just a time to gather prayer and worship, um, family style, everybody's welcome, no child care, so children are welcome in here or to kind of run around. 
and we could get somebody to police the area <laughs> and make sure people were safe. But um, we'll deal with that as we, as we always do. But we're going to just have a time to gather here for that this evening. And then uh, Saturday, I don't have a slide for this, but I have notes. Saturday, June 18th. So the Saturday before Father's Day um, is a men's breakfast here from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. So men, breakfast on the house here uh, the Saturday before Father's Day. So that's exciting that we can gather together and eat because uh, you want to draw men, you provide food, and that typically does the trick. Amen. Uh, so, awesome. Praise God. So we, uh, this morning, are continuing our series through the book of John, uh, the series that you may believe, and that believing in him you may have life in his name, that this is the way that we would live, that we would truly live and have life because we believe in Christ, and that, that, that because through the belief that life itself would become more vivid, that our purpose would be actualized, that we wouldn't just be taking up space in this life, taking up breath, marking time, but that we would be truly living on purpose for the purpose that God, our Creator, has given us. So uh, we are passing out some Bibles if you need one. Danny uh, is fantastic with the Bibles here. Uh, he's going to get you one. Can you raise one of those up, Danny? So these red Bibles, by the way, if you need a Bible, you could take one of these red Bibles home with you. Uh, we, we actually want to give them away. <laughs> we have a surplus right now, and we want to just uh, keep those going because they do no good in a cardboard box, I'll tell you that. They do much better opened up and being, renewing your, your hearts and minds. So take one of those home. Feel free to do that. It is our gift to you, and we, um, we're in John 9 this morning. John 9, we're going to be finishing up the chapter uh, of 9, chapter 9 this morning, uh, finally. So uh, just this is about our 46th week, I believe, in the book of John, going through the book of John, 46 weeks. When I, I mapped out this study, kind of the roadmap of through, through the book of John, I went through it. I was like, okay, we'll, do, we'll hit these verses, and then we'll hit these verses, and I think one week we could cover this. And I mapped it out. It was about 54 weeks, so the entire book of John. And as you know, John has 21 chapters. So uh, we're, we're, we're going a little slow, but I hope that's okay. Uh, as we're going through it, it's just there's, sometimes I want to cover a bigger chunk and it just is, is hard. Uh, someone mentioned last week that the, the PR so far, personal record, most verses uh, hit was last week. We went from verse uh, 5 all the way to 34. And uh, it was a lot. I, I was like tired afterward. I felt like I could run a marathon. Though I never have. Um, so this morning, the, the title is Believing is Seeing. Believing is Seeing. So you've probably heard the term uh, seeing is believing, right? You probably have heard this flipped, that seeing is believing, and it's a sentiment like, I'm not going to believe something unless I see it with my own eyes. And that's pretty much true in this world, uh, but I've been thinking about it that it actually, you know, we live in a time where actually seeing is not necessarily all that helpful, uh, I watched a, a video recently, it was the five most mysterious things caught on camera, and I watched this video, and every one of them, I'm like, that's probably CGI. Yeah, it's probably fake. You know, and you're going through the comments, and it's like, oh yeah, this is from a video. You know, but it looks so real. I mean, one of them, this guy was driving this truck and through an intersection, and there was someone on like a bike, like, like with a trailer, and they were right there, and this truck didn't see it and like ran the red light. And in the video, it's like the flash appeared and got the guy from the bike and put him over here. And then the guy stopped, he got out of his truck, he thought he hit him, and they were gone. And it was like amazing, caught on camera, like a traffic footage camera. But you're like, no, oh, that, that just looks fake. Uh, you know, and apparently it was, um, it, was, it was from some video game. But a lot can be, can be tricked uh, with, with CGI and different things. And also, uh, I don't know if you've watched, ever watched the show Brain Games. Anyone seen the show Brain Games? So it's a, a very popular show in our house. 
um, brain games, and they, they show a lot of uh, optical illusions in that show. They show a lot of things, you're looking at it, and then they're like, what do you see? And you're like, oh, well, clearly I see this. And then they're like, are you sure you see that? You know, and, and then they like do something, and you're like, oh, man, oh, I, don't, I thought I did, but I don't. And they're like, you know, they do it on the street a lot where they're actually looking at the thing right there. So a lot of ways that the eyes are even tricked. But spiritually, um, uh, uh, th- this, is, this is flipped, that seeing is not always believing, but in fact, biblically, believing is seeing. As we will see in these verses, the, the truest form of seeing is through believing in who Christ is and who God is. The truth of God allows us to truly see everything as it is. This whole section we've been going through, it's been a man who was born blind and Jesus walks by and he he heals him and he puts mud in his eyes, remember, and, and, and restores his eyes or recreates his eyes. There's all kinds of theological debate as to what actually happened there with the mud and the eyes. And, and, and then he goes and he washes the mud and he comes back seeing. But this whole section is building to this point right here. This whole section is building to that he hasn't truly seen. Like he's seen physically now and it's amazing but he's starting to really see because he's starting to really believe. And as this section has, has, has grown, as we walk through last week, the, kind of, the responses from the miracle that occurred, it was like people were, were wondering what happened. Was this the same guy that was born blind? What's going on here? And there's a lot of debate. And eventually he gets cast out of the synagogue, out of his, out of, out of his culture, out of his his, his people and just societal norms. But the Bible speaks that, that believing really frees us up to see. One of my favorite verses, um, I, pastors say that a lot, right? one of my favorite verses, like, like every verse, one of my favorite verses. But this is truly a verse I really love. Hebrews 11.6 says this, says, But without faith it is impossible to please him, God. For he who comes to God must believe, check this out, must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So he's saying without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must first and foremost believe that he is. He is the starting point. You believe that he is and then it says he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Check this out. James 1, 6 through 8 says this, But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that person suppose that they shall receive anything from the Lord. They are double minded in all their way, double minded and unstable in all their ways. Did you get that? That 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 doubting and that doubting of who God is, God's saying, don't suppose you should receive anything then from the Lord. The Bible also says that when we draw near to God, He draws near to us. So there's this interesting aspect in the Bible of who God is and the way He's, he's engineered things is that when we believe, when we start there, because a lot of people are like, oh, well, I'll want to see first and then I'll believe. No, God's saying you believe and then you will see. Because you believe, you, you believe that I am, and then I will reward, then you'll, you'll be rewarded for those who diligently seek me. And things will be open to you, and your understanding will be enlightened. And this is the truth of life that I've found with God. When I believe God, I, tr- I trust your word, I take at, at who you are, I can see your, your invisible attributes everywhere, the power of your creation. Clearly, I am just a speck of nothing in the whole cosmos of things. And God, I believe that you are. I start there and I walk that in faith. And then I see. And then I see things. And I'm, oh God, you're there. And you answer this. And yes, this is, and and God leads and he guides and he opens the doors when we start there. And so these verses, verse 35 through 41, if you could stand as we read these verses Six quick verses. Verse 35 says, Jesus heard that they had cast him out 
And having found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You who have seen him, you have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. I like how Jesus often speaks in third person. He said, he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. Father, may you enlighten us this morning with your word. You are good, God. May you give us ears to hear and eyes to see. Open the eyes of our hearts, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. I love, you can have a seat. I love when the worship and uh, the message collide. We often, actually almost never, actually if I give Jay a suggestion, he like veers away from that. No, No, but but we, you know, often, most of the time it's like studying the word and then then the worship is being put together. And uh, open the eyes of my heart, Lord, is like a classic Christian hit. It's, It's kind of, uh, old school. I, I, I love that song. I grew up with that song. Uh, I don't know if anyone has heard of Sonic Flood. Anybody? Sonic Flood? The Pink Album? The Pink Album, you know? And, and this was like one of the very first Christian songs I had heard that I was really like, yes. You know, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. You know, and that's just so fitting with where we are today and where, these, where we are with these verses. And there's four, four points uh, that I want to bring out from here that uh, why uh, uh, seeing or why believing is seeing. In verse 35, Jesus heard that they had cast him out and having found him, he said. And the first point is that this is the most humbling reality. This is the most humbling reality that God finds us. God finds us. A lot of people will go through something or they'll, come to, they'll, they'll give their life to the Lord. They'll be like, I found the Lord. I found God. That's an that's okay way to phrase it. I get what you mean. But really, God finds us because we're the ones that were lost. God's not lost. We are lost. He finds us. And this is a, a humbling reality. And I love this section in, in verse 35 because they had just cast him out. If you recall, he was like, this is an amazing thing. Or do you guys want to be his disciples? And he's a little snarky, but he's, he's just saying what had happened, that he had been healed by this Jesus, something that had never been done before. Even in all the Old Testament, all the miracles in the Old Testament, which actually aren't too many, but th- there had never been someone born blind that had had their sight restored until this. And, and so he's just recounting the story again and again to them and finally starts you know, they're very interested, obviously, in this and, and trying to find a way around it or find some loophole, or maybe this wasn't him, or maybe he wasn't really blind, or whatever it was, how people try and explain things away, and eventually with utter contempt after he says, you know, do you want to be his disciples? <laughs> you know, this is amazing. You guys, he healed me. You guys don't even know who he is. Yeah, and, and so they cast him out of the synagogue. They cast him out of, of really the culture. The culture was built around the synagogue, the Jewish culture was, was built around that experience. And this would cast them out, not only of, of their like church religious system, but this would cast them out of a lot of uh, cultural norms and a lot of groups and a lot of community. He was cast out of that now because a lot of it was tied into this. And because of Jesus, he was cast out. And if you remember from verse 7, Jesus kind of exits the scene. He heals the guy, and then he, he's gone from the narrative here in verse 7, and they're talking with the neighbors and all who were around. Where did Jesus go? I'm not really sure. But in verse 35, he, re, he comes back into to this scene and walks back into this man's life. And it's interesting that he does it at this time because the guy has stood his, his ground. He said what's happened. He said, you know, this, this man, this, this prophet, and then he kind of challenges the religious 
establishment of the day, and then they cast him out, and then Jesus comes to him. The Bible says that, that Jesus is a friend of sinners. The Bible says that we can, we can call God our friend. I don't, know, I don't know if we understand the implications of that. There's, there's been polls on, on what, what the best definition for a friend is. What like the, the, the most well-rounded definition for a friend is. What really captures it. And, and a leading poll said this, that the best definition for what a friend is, is somebody who comes in when everyone else goes out. You know, and that is a great definition of a friend. And, and that's what you see here. It, with Jesus, the Son of God, when he's cast out, this man who had been a, a beggar at the, the, the door of the temple the whole, his whole life, thinking that those people that were going into the temple surely must be the ones that would be, have their hearts tugged and pulled on when they saw him in need. Surely those people would help him as they probably did and gave alms to him and, and kept him sustained, that those are the ones that have now cast him out after he's been healed. And as he's cast out, Jesus comes in to his life. And how true that is in, in our life, that no matter what we are cast out, any stand we take for the Lord, if we're cast out or, or excluded from something because we are Christians or, or be, for, for what we believe, that Jesus comes in. That there's a closeness with the Lord that you get through those experiences that you might not get apart from them. So he's rejected by the early or by the earthly religionists here. And he's, he's, he's kicked out of life altogether spiritually and socially. And, and he was cast out on three levels. They had like three levels of excommunication. I'm not going to go into it here because there's a lot of words we don't understand. But he was cast out in three levels. All three levels. It wasn't just like you're isolated for a week, you know, or you're, you're uh, publicly reprimanded for seven to 30 days. But he was, boom, he was cast out for life. Um, here. And sometimes it could be a privilege to be cast out of places for the Lord. I don't know if you've ever, uh, you, you know, been excluded from an event because of your faith or, or, or what you believe, but sometimes there's just a nearness that comes with the Lord in through that. Uh, church history is full of stories like this. One as such is, is Martin Luther. Uh, not Martin Luther King Jr., um, though he got some of his name from that and was named after the great reformer uh, Martin Luther, who was a reformer, and he was, he was cast out because he, he, he challenged the, the Catholic Church of the day that was saying heaven could be bought with alms, and, and, and if you gave enough money, you could enter heaven, and if you did so much amount of works, you could get into heaven. And Martin Luther, when he nailed his 95 theses to the, uh, the, the door of the church there in, in Wittenberg, Germany, uh, he said, uh, basically, he was struck in Romans that the just will live by faith. That it's by faith alone that saves a person. And the Catholic Church cast him out. They, they excommunicated him. And I'm sure he was glad. And I know we're glad. That was the Protestant Reformation. That was the, the beginning of, of, we're part of the Protestant Church. That we say, no, it's not by works it's not by, by giving anything, it's not by anything we can do that we attain heaven. It's by grace alone through faith. And that is a glorious truth that we are saved by grace through faith. And we live by faith in the Son of God who gave his life for us. So, what a great truth that we have in that. And surely he was glad to be cast out. And when he was rejected by the earthly religionists, he was accepted by the heavenly representative, namely Christ. And he reappears in this scene just to, to meet him where he is at. And that's our God, that he, he meets us where we are at. So Jesus found him. Again, it's, it's, it's we that are, are lost. The Bible says actually that, that no one seeks God. No one looks for God on their own. Romans 1 through, through 3 kind of makes the case that we don't seek God. People on their own don't seek God. We're born sinners and we have this, this sin wound in us and we go after anything and everything else oftentimes except for God. 
There's a quote by C.S. Lewis that one of my favorites, uh, there I go again, Uh, several of his quotes are my favorites, but he has this quote, listen to this, he says, it's a sad thing to come to God as a last resort. If God were proud, he would hardly have us on such terms, but he isn't. Isn't that good? That gives me, that gives me goose pimples when I hear that verse, or when I hear that, that quote, that, that we can go after every, everything else, anything else except God. Often we come to God, in fact, as a last resort. I mean, maybe it's true in our life that after we've gone to this and we've looked for satisfaction here and in this person and in this thing, and we're empty because we always will be empty because we're made eternal. We're made to crave that which is eternal, namely God. And so when we go after everything else, we, we're empty. And that's most of our testimony. This is my, te- you know, my testimony is that you, know, you go after everything and then, okay, then you, then you go to something draws you to God. And in that, you find like, oh, God, you are everything indeed. But it's crazy that often we can go after everything else. And I love what C.S. Lewis says because he says, if God was proud, <laughs> he would hardly have you on such terms. But he isn't. Think about if in a relationship, if you like somebody and you were going after them, and they're like, mm, no, nah, uh-uh, you know, and they like went to everybody else and hooked up with them and them and they're trying, you know, and after they just like went through that, they weren't happy, then they're like, okay. This person, you'd be like, what? No, no, yeah, stop. This is so disrespectful. <laughs> like, like, no, but but yet, that is pretty much everyone's testimony. That we could just look for satisfaction in everything else except God, the creator, the sustainer, the giver of life, the one who is, is worthy, the one who is holy, 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 the one who is, is good. He's got, he's got 10,000 pleasures in his right hand. He, he's eternal, that every good thing flows from him. Every good thing we know, every good thing we've experienced is an echo of who he is. It's a shadow, and he is the substance. And it's crazy, but I get it's because we, we don't seek God. And, and, and Romans 1-3 through 3 makes that clear. It's the indictment. The Bible says that no one comes to the Father unless the Father draws him. So though this guy was kicked out of the temple, the Lord of the temple goes to him. Isn't that cool? He was kicked out of the temple, but the Lord of the temple goes to him. And this is Jesus' style, is it not? Jesus' style that in John 6.37, he says, whoever comes to me, whoever comes to me, no matter what condition they're in, no matter what they've been through, no matter what they look like, no matter how much baggage they got, whoever comes to me, I will in, by no means cast that way. That he will receive that person. Luke 19.10 says, The Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. He's come to seek and save that which was lost. The, the Bible tells the story of the parable of, of Jesus, the good shepherd, who leaves the 99 to go after the one sheep that goes astray. He leaves the 99 safe and secure, and he goes after the one that has found itself in quite a mess because it wandered off and away, Matthew 18 tells us. He's relentless. God is relentless to hunt us down, to track us down, to not let us drift too far when our perspective gets jaded or we fall out of the Word, when we fall out of fellowship, when, we, when, we, when our prayers lack. God is faithful to draw us back again. Think about when the Lord found you. Think about when he found you. When I think about when he found me, it, <laughs> it just makes me laugh. It makes, it makes me laugh because I thought I was so cool. You know, I just like, I was just so lost. I was just like, you know, my wife makes fun of me sometimes because I had this face like, like you know, just in pictures be like. <laughs> and just, you know, had things I thought were going, had things I thought I wanted to do. And I look back, it's just silly, you know, I was like sagging, you know, acne, you know, and just like thought I was so cool. And when I look back, I was like, man, I was so lost. And the Lord found me, though at first I gave him the stiff arm, 
God was faithful and He found me. So think about where you were when God found you and thank Him for His grace in your life. And the second point is the most important priority. Verse, verse uh, at, at end of 35, He finds Him and then He says, Do you believe in the Son of Man? The first thing He says, so this guy's been cast out like, oh, kind of maybe bewildered, like, oh, man, like, even my parents, remember his parents were like, let him speak for himself. They're, they're afraid of the, the Jews and the religious elite, and they're, like, retreating back to, like, the, cynic, the, the people, the, the religious people, and, 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 and so he's, like, cast, even his parents are like, hey, you know, like, see ya, and uh, so he says, do you believe in the Son of Man? He doesn't, like, hey, hey, how you doing? You doing good? Like, Want some water? Uh, he says, he starts with the most important priority. He answered, verse 36, and who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, you have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. Again, if I've, I've actually gone through my Bible in the book of John and circled everywhere that it says believe. And I think it's like 129 times, but that's why it's the book uh, that you may believe. That's why the series is that you may believe, you know, because it's just uh, everywhere. You see belief, you even see it contrasted where there's unbelief that, as we looked at last week. But this is the most important priority for this man that he, he believe. He believe on who Jesus is. So it's a question about faith from the outset. And in the Greek, it's even a little more stark. In English, in ours, it says, do you believe in the Son of Man? In the Greek, the, the construction from what I've studied is that it says, you, do you believe? Like, it's like, oh, hey, whoa, well, hey, coming at me, <laughs> you know, with that question, all right. And it's, it's to get his attention and to focus and emphasize the spiritual need. And this is the most important reality, so, or the most important priority, so not only the most humbling reality that God seeks us, but the most important priority within that is that we would respond with belief. And that's why Jesus' first question here is, do you believe? Do you believe? Believing is seeing. I want to say here that your faith is more valuable than your health. Your faith is more valuable than your health. And this is probably most vividly displayed in Matthew 5, 29, when Jesus says, if your right eye causes you to sin, remember he just healed the man from blindness here. So, you know, Matthew 5, 29 says, if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you, for it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And this whole, whole, whole point of the healing, yes, it's great this, this man is healed and he can now see. That's uh, beautiful. That, that's God's ultimate intention, lest it be for the fallen world we live in that experiences sin and disease and, and, and all these ailments. One day this man's eye, one day he would see for sure in heaven. We, we must always remember that God is eternal. One day he will see way better than he even sees now. Uh, yeah, I know what your vision is. My vision used to be uh, what they called better than perfect. I actually haven't got it checked in a while. Uh, I still think it's, it's fairly good, but it, I, I used to always brag because it was like, I forget how they say it, 2015 or 1520 or something like that. And, and, and so I was like, oh, it's great. But, but this, this, so no matter if this guy saw 2020 or, or whatever it is, that one day he will see better than ever before. This miracle was to point out the spiritual truth and reality that truly anchors this miracle. Fanny Crosby, um, she's, I don't know if you've heard of her, probably um, haven't. I, I hadn't heard of her, though she's written over 9,000 hymns. So she's, uh, she's a woman, um, she's passed away now, but she's written, she wrote over 9,000 hymns. She was blind from six months onward in her life. And so how you write 9,000 hymns when you're blind, I don't know. But I'm like, man, I haven't written one hymn or song. Or, you know, I'm like, and I can see. It's kind of like a good challenge, right? Like she wrote 9,000 hymns and she was blind. 
So uh, we should all like write songs, at least just for, just for this. Uh, but she wrote 9,000 hymns. She actually had to start using another name because it's just like your hymn, Fanny Crosby. Your, the hymnals would be filled with like Fanny Crosby. So she had like come up with other names, like pseudo names, just so that all these hymns didn't have her name. Because um, it's like Chris Tomlin, Chris Tomlin, Chris, you know, it's like maybe uh, Tomlin should come up with another name. But she, she said this, a well-meaning preacher came up to her after an event one time and he said, he said, I think it's a, a great pity that the master did not give you sight when he showered so many other gifts upon you. And Fanny Crosby responded at once as she had heard such comments before. And she said, do you know that if at birth I had been able to make one petition, it would have been that I was born blind? Because when I get to heaven, the first face, face that I shall ever gladden my sight will be that of my Savior. It's amazing, right? That she saw. Like, yeah, she was blind, but her, her, her faith, her belief, she, she saw. It's a beautiful thing. And, and that she was like, to have that perspective is, is pretty amazing. And, and so this, this man born blind here, he, he is asked if he believes, and then he is, he's ready to believe. He's ready to, re- to receive the Lord. Obviously, he's been healed, um, but Jesus asked him if, if, he's, if he believes, and he asked, who should I believe? He wants to know. He, he doesn't want to toy around with it. He wants to know, you know who it is that I should believe. He, he hasn't seen Jesus, because remember when Jesus put the mud in his eyes, the guy was still blind, so uh, maybe he's heard his voice. Um, I don't uh, know if he recognized the voice or what, but he hadn't seen him, and so he asked who it was, and then Jesus, in classic uh, third person, as he does sometimes, uh, says, you have seen him, and so the guy's like, when? You know, and actually, Jesus is saying, referring to, like, right now, you know, you've, you've seen him, hint, hint, now, and by him, he means me, him, the guy talking, but Jesus, and it is... <laughs> And it is he who is speaking to you. So this, this man was ready. He had been waiting his whole life for the Messiah. He'd been waiting his whole life to be touched by the Lord. And he was. And he was ready. And I wonder if in our lives, if there's people around us who have been waiting their whole life to be touched by the Lord. If, if they've been waiting their whole life to hear that God loves them. Uh, you know, I wonder, if maybe a person we sit next to at work or at school or that we ride the train with or that we're next to in line or the person that maybe makes our coffee, uh, I wonder if they've been waiting their whole life to hear. <laughs> I don't know why, uh, I'm emotional right now, but I'm just thinking of uh, of one of the baristas that I get coffee um, at Pete's, and one that I see often. She, uh, you know, it's hard to talk sometimes when they're making your coffee. There's other people around, and but this this girl, she's really cool, and we've, you know, she's really cool, and, and we struck up a good conversation each time, and, and I was talking to her, I invited her to church, and she said, you know, no one's invited me, she said, I want to go, and we're working on that stat, but she, she, uh, she said, I'm, start, I'm starting to think God's not there, because she kind of been generally raised that, you know, God's there, and, you know, whatever, and didn't really go to church or anything, but that was just kind of implied. And, and she, she, she's so ready to hear. And I'm like, man, I just want to have a conversation. right. Now. I mean, she's just ready. Like, I'm, 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 I'm starting to think God's not there, but I'm, I'm, I'm open to hearing. Is he? You know? And it was just like, man, there's, this is so ripe for a good conversation about the Lord and to walk through her with these things. And I'm wondering how many people we come across that are at that point. 
You know, the Bible says that the, the fields are white for harvest, that, that people are just ready, but the workers are few. The laborers are few. The people that, that are actually going to tell someone, I'm so glad the women's ministry is going through that book, tell someone is just, we don't do it. It's just the bottom line. We don't do it nearly as often as we should. And, I, and, and when I point this way, I have three fingers pointing back here. You know, that so often I don't do it. I wonder how many people are ready to hear about the love of God in their life. Because what's better than that? What's greater than than the love of God, that that you're created by God and he loves you and he has a purpose for your life and and to walk through that. Yeah, your sin is separating you from God and we gotta deal with that. And FYI, it's been dealt with. Christ, he came to the cross, he died for your sin, he died to, to forgive you and to give you new life. He's risen. He's the, he, we were praying this morning, he has the keys of death and of hell. I love that. You know, and John, we were reading, and it's like, John has that vision, and he's like, hey, John, and he holds him on the right shoulder. He's like, John, I was dead, but I'm alive. You know, it's just like, yes, that's our God. I was dead, but I'm alive. I died for the sin of the world, but I'm alive. And I have the keys of death and of hell. I wonder how many people in our life are ready. Just ready to hear, you know? Ready to believe. I bet there's a lot. I bet there's a lot. So this is the highest priority that that we would believe. John 3.16 speaks of it that he who believes shall not perish but have everlasting life. Amazing, amazing verse. So, this word believe is just not to acknowledge God exists, but it's to truly, boom, trust fall, rest in Him. You know, it's like we did, I did a trust fall with my kids, and we were at the Father Son retreat, and there was this like thing about that high, and so they're on it, and I'm down here. So it was like big time. And I wasn't catching them to like low. So it was like, <laughs> it was a serious trust fall where they had to like, whoo, they were like 90 degrees, you know, like completely horizontal before they got caught. So Taj was doing good with it. You know, he's like, Cause, you know, I've caught him pretty much every time. <laughs> I've, I've caught him every time. And then, and then Christian, he's like, oh, you know, and he did it. He's like, he was pumped up after it because he got a little scared. But Liam, it was, it was, you know, he hadn't done it as much. And he, it was a lot further down for him. So he kept going like, ah! You know, and like curling up in a ball. I'm like, no, just like, don't, don't bend. Just plank and go. And it was a little harder. And so that's what this, the word believe means is, is to, to fully commit, to fully trust, believe, rely on, and adhere to. And so verse 38, he said, Lord, I believe. Look at how he, he calls him Lord, verse 38. Right off the bat, he's just so ready. Lord, Master. Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. And so the third point is the, the most obvious certainty. The most obvious certainty of our belief that we do believe that, that it is what we have committed to the, the, the fruit of our belief, you should say, the most obvious certainty is that we worship. It says, Lord, I believe. And then he worshiped him. Like, boom, right, right, right there on the spot. Like, oh, this, this is what I've been waiting for. I've been waiting for the Savior. I've been waiting for this. I, I, I've been sitting at this doorstep and he's waiting. Lord, I believe. And he worshiped. I, I don't know how he worshiped. You know, obviously he didn't pop on some David Crowder or anything, and you know, but he 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 worshiped. He he gave his adoration there in that moment. And you see, this man's been on a spiritual journey, even in verse nine. Regardless of his whole life and whatever else we could conjecture about it, chapter nine. Verse 11, he called he's Jesus, he was this, this man that had healed me. Starts out with, with that he's just a man. Verse 17 says, 
when they ask him, who, who do you think he is? He says, a prophet. So he's up in it a little bit. And, and then here in verse 38, his faith is in the Son of God, that he is the Lord of lords. And so he's been on this spiritual journey to arrive at who Jesus is. Often the case in salvation that we hear this or we hear that and we, we investigate here, we kind of push on and our, our belief becomes increased but it will become certain and evident in our worship when we worship the Lord. And see, worship is, is not just the, the time of singing songs, although that's an incredible uh, avenue or, or way to express worship. A beautiful way to do it is through song. One of our favorites, God has, has made us to, to worship. He's it's an amazing thing when people who don't typically sing, sing together. You know, this is an amazing thing that God's called us to do as a church, to sing, to gather together, and to sing, because you don't go to a lot of other places where, where people sing that normally don't sing or shouldn't sing uh, if they're tone deaf like myself. So just a quick side note on that. Sometimes when I'm singing worship, I hear myself. And I'm like, everyone else just needs to sing a little louder because I don't, I don't sound very good. <laughs> you know, I don't want to ruin it. So it's like, just sing out. You know, and I love it when I'm like singing as loud as I can and I can't even hear myself. Those are amazing times of worship where I'm singing, because I, I want to sing and I want to sing loud, but I don't want other people to like be distracted by like, what is that noise? Like, what is that? It's like, no ups and rhythms and but worship is just one our singing is just one avenue of worship our life should be a lifestyle of worship that that we worship the lord in in everything what does the bible say whether we whether we eat or whether we drink we do it in the name of the lord right we do it for god's glory like that and that's not just saying just okay now now singing eating and drinking those are the only things it's like that what it's saying is no matter what we do, we do it as unto the Lord. We do it in a heart of worship. That we would praise God through whatever we could. And I love that about Christ is that we can worship through whatever. We have this freedom that no matter what we do, we can worship through it. When we're working, man, our, my boss is a jerk. The Bible says, hey, don't worry about him. Work as unto me. I'm your boss. I, will, I see what you're doing. I can give favor. I can reward. I can teach through all those hardships you're going through at your job. Like, we worship through all circumstances. When, things, when tragedy strikes, we worship. We worship the God who can, out of the ashes and the dust, create beauty and bring purpose through it. And never forget that He's eternal. And he will work all things to the good of those who love him, whether it be in this life, but certainly in the next. So we worship, and it becomes a lifestyle. When we eat and drink, that's also a good time, as Colossians says. Like, I don't know if you've ever eaten and been like praising God when you do it, but it just the food tastes better. You know, just try. When you're, you know, we pray for the meal, and just like, ah, it tastes so good when you're thinking about God you're so you give you've given taste buds and and this is so good when you're doing the thing you love to do whatever hobby it is painting or dancing or skiing or surfing or hiking or whatever it is did you know you could worship in that isn't that cool that no matter what you're doing you could you could worship in it you don't want to paddle out in the sea it's like man I get to worship the God who created Great white sharks that could eat me. Wait, no, but I get to worship. You know, I try to think about that, but you know, I get to worship God and all His majesty no matter what. So believing is the proof that He found you. Worshiping is the proof you believe. And obeying proves that you've been worshiping. Because when you worship, you're going to want to obey you're going to want more of that. You're going to want more of the Lord. So this follows belief. I love seeing people transformed 
in believing into to worshipers. I think of a, a, a young guy in the youth group, and I remember um, worship music, because there's a style of worship music that we have, right? I remember when I first got saved, I like like classic, I was in this like, I like like Led Zeppelin, I was in this classic rock mode, and I'm like, oh, worship music's so boring, you know? It's like, where's the guitar solos? Um, which, it's just, I like guitar solos still, but, you know, and I, I didn't like the style and different things, and I did go to church, it kind of had like some amped up, amped up rock worship, but um, I remember just, you know, that fading away as I started to grow in the Lord. It was like, I didn't care what style it was really. What was it saying? You know, what, what were the words behind it? You know, they say a lot of kids are like, oh, I just like the beat. You know, like a lot of times in church, like, oh, you know, hey, you guys should listen to Christian music and not like secular music because some of the things they're singing about, uh, you don't really want those in your mind. Like, oh, this used to be the thing. Like, oh, like, I just like the beat, you know. I don't even hear the words. Like, no, no, no. We hear the words. Like, I get it. There's some good beats in a lot of secular songs. There's some awesome beats. But, but you know, when you grow, there's times I'm like, you know, I'm like, oh, yeah, I do love that beat. But I just really don't like what he's talking about here. Like, womanizing. And, the, the, you know, I just, I don't want to go there. And so, uh, what was I talking about? So, there was a young guy in the youth group. And, and I remember he, 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 you know, he's growing in the Lord. But he was like, I just can't get into worship, man. I just, you know, he was into hip hop. And, and so the, the worship music with the guitar, and I got it. I was like, yeah, I get that. I know. There's some good Christian worship. Like, hey, check out Lecrae or Cross Movement. But um, it was so cool because as he grew, he started to love worship. Even the worship that we were doing, you know, just the guitar. And, and I remember we were at this trip, uh, this, this little mission trip that we did. And um, it was so funny. We were all spread out in this big sanctuary at this church in Oakland. And we were all spread out. And, and my phone was being used as the playlist. And it was like on shuffle. And, and I, do, I, had some, I have some secular songs on there, you know, I'm not going to lie. So, um, and I'm like, uh-oh. And we were, I'm like, uh, like way far away from it. It's way up there. And I'm like, okay. So I'm kind of distracted, like, what's going to be next? Because we're all spread out just like seeking the Lord and worshiping. And the next song comes on, and it's like, doom, doom. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like Michael Jackson's beat it just came. You know, and I'm like, no, it's like, oh, spirit, no, come back. And, and so it was so cool, because this guy was closest to the thing, and this was probably his jam. Like, he loved Michael, Michael Jackson. And, but it was so cool, because right away he got up, boom, and he put it to a worship song. You know, and I was like, that's so cool. Like, he wanted to worship. He's like, Michael Jackson, I love you, but another time. You know, and, and he's like, boom, <laughs> put it to worship. And because I was way far away, I was like, it's going to be like halfway through the song before I get, get to And everyone's going to be like looking around like, should we still pray? But it was cool just seeing, seeing him uh, love worship. And, and the fourth and final point this morning is verse 39 through 41. It says, Jesus said, for judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say, We see, your guilt remains. And the fourth point this morning is the, that this is the most sobering uh, mystery. The most sobering mystery here and there's two kinds of people uh, there's there's two kinds of people that one is spiritual sight comes to those who confess that they they can't see this is the humble person that acknowledges their need for a savior the bible says that god hates the proud but he gives grace all day to the humble um you know the Matthew 5, Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, says, Jesus says, Bless, first one, blessed are the poor in spirit, um, for they shall, I forget, see God or something, but blessed are the poor in spirit. So that's the first type of person. The second type of person is blindness is a condition for those who, are, who arrogantly claim that they can see just fine without Jesus. And that's what he says here. He's saying, those who say, oh, we see. 
They don't see. Their guilt remains. Their guilt remains. And it's kind of like Romans 5 talks about that as sin entered the world through Adam, through one man, and, and then death spread to all men because all sinned. It makes a, a side note. It says, for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. So it's saying that, you know, though people may not be aware of, of the sin, you know, these people before the law came, they weren't aware of sin because the law hadn't come and said, defined what sin was. It said, nevertheless, death spread. Nevertheless, they died, which is the ultimate effect of sin. And so no one is guiltless before God. He, he, he says, for judgment I came into the world that those who do not see may see and those who see may become blind. And God is on a mission to give faith and that people would see the true reality of who he is. And it's, it's why the book of John was written. It's why he does give faith. It's why he's called us to, to share the gospel with people, to, to share God's love with people. Because the, the Bible speaks that all people are spiritually born DOA, dead on arrival, spiritually. Like, we're, we're dead to God on arrival because of sin. Because sin has separated people from God. That's why God is a missionary God. That's why Christianity reaches down Christianity reaches down, every other religion is, is reaching up or saying you got to do this and this and this, you got to do this and this and this. Christianity, God reaches down to a lost and dying and broken world and wants to give true sight and true light to them. Listen to Matthew 13, this might help clarify it if you're a bit confused. Jesus says, therefore, this is interest. this is very interesting to me, this is This is the lens, though, that, that you must look through. It says, therefore, Jesus speaking, therefore I speak to them in parables. So parables were earthly stories with a heavenly meaning. Kind of, kind of veiled a little bit, you know. Parables were like, huh, what does that mean? You had to, like, go this way. You had to, like, look for the meaning. You had, you're like, here's the story, and you're like, you had to think about it. You had to dig a little deeper. And so he says, therefore I speak to them in parables, because seeing... They do not see. And hearing, they do not hear. Nor do they understand. And in them, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled. So then Jesus quotes Isaiah. And he says, Isaiah 6 says this, Hearing, you will hear and shall not understand. And seeing, you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. He says, blessed are your eyes, for they see. He's not talking physical. He said, they see because they've believed. Because the ones that heard the parables and started with a point of they want to seek God, they want to seek the truth of what is being said here, and they pursue God, and they seek for that meaning, and they, they, they pursue it, they will see. God will reveal himself to those people. It's an amazing thing that God speaks in parables. Don't get me wrong. Like, I'm, it, 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 you know, I, I've had to come on board with, with, with the, the truth of the scriptures here. There's been times like, God, why, why do you speak in parables? I even think today, God, I, I, one, I, I'm, I love debate. I love uh, watching debates and listening to debates and getting in debates. Um, but, you know, and I really, I really do love it. Um, I don't think, you know, especially about God, because it's like, what could two human beings possibly talk about that has more ramifications or is more important or is more glorious? <laughs> yeah, like, we don't have to argue. We can just, we can hang out and talk, you know? But I love, I love the, the intellectual rigor of it. And sometimes I talk to people and I'm like, 
how can you not see it? <laughs> like, I see it, but how can you not see it? And, I, and I'm not so much, it, it is a mystery. I'm like, and I go back to the truth of the word. I'm like, well, God, he spoke in parables. And I see it. I, I, I see it because I've believed it and because I've walked in it and I've sought and I've searched. The Bible says, seek the Lord with all your heart and you will You'll find him. Really, he finds us. See, now, the, now we see the backstage pass that we receive behind the curtain that God really finds us. You know, the, it, it says that no man has sought the Lord unless the Lord first sought the man. But, but you know, even in our finding, seeking and finding, it's like God, God, was, God was doing that. You know, we just didn't see it at the time. And so even, even when I look at, at creation or, or we get in these, these debates about, like, scientific evidence, you know, I'm like, can you not see it? And we talked a little bit last week, you know, that, that someone like, like Elon Musk will, will say, oh, we're in a simulation. Like, we're, we're most likely in a simulation. Like, we are, you know, we're in the matrix, le- legit. Like, this is, I'm not, I'm not joking, like, people, physicists, astrophysicists, cosmologists, brilliant people, way, 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 way smarter than myself. Like, they will say, no, we're in the matrix. Because they've looked at, they, they look at the evidence and they say, oh, well, it's code. Everything is amazing. It's, wow, whoa, it's crazy. But, but they don't believe. They don't go toward God. They, they, they go the other way. And, and, and this is saying that it's even like in, in, in everything, God speaks in parables. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I believe that. Like in creation, no matter where we look, when I look at it, I see, I'm like, Oh, God, this shows your handiwork. Like, that's amazing. Like, the universe is how big? What? You know? God, <clears throat> what if the universe was like, like 10 light years and we, there was like a, a wall? You know, I'd be like, oh, that's kind of lame. You know? We could like then think of finite space, but we can't. Like, we can, it's infinite <clears throat> as far as we know. We just know the known universe. So it's like, <clears throat> it speaks of who God is. I know I'm getting off on a tangent, but... <laughs> I really like God <laughs> and, and how he's made things. <clears throat> and, and this says, I love how Jesus ends this <coughs> verse 13 or, of Matthew, uh, this verse I quoted. He says, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn. Lest they should understand with their hearts and turn. Check this out so that I should heal them, so that they would see, so that they would hear. That is God's heart in the matter of it. Yes, He speaks in parables. And He draws people, and people come to faith at different times, but but our job is to align with God and say, God, who have You placed around us that they are waiting? Like this man in John 9, who the whole reason you did this miraculous thing in his life was to bring him to faith. You know, we could, we could be like, oh yeah, pray with someone to receive the Lord. But man, no one was healed of, 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 of their blind. Like, we would probably geek out on that. Like, if someone got healed of their, their blind all their life and they got healed, we'd be like, oh my gosh, amazing. there'd be like videos, you know? But the more amazing thing is Jesus just did that, one, to prove who he was while he was here, but he, he did that also just to bring this person to faith. That's why he did that. That was the overriding principle. That was the more important reality of it. And he says, if you were blind, you would have no guilt, but now you say, we see, and your guilt remains. So they were so fixed on what they thought and who they thought God was, and it wasn't Jesus, and, and, and Jesus was not the Messiah. They were getting hardened in their unbelief. And he says, your guilt remains. But it didn't have to. It didn't have to. We know the grace of God is available for everybody. It didn't have to. If they would have turned, if they would have believed, if they would have received, God surely, with open arms, would have received them to himself. Would have renewed them. Would have, have shown them the their, their purpose that he has for them in this life. And that's for us. God says the same for us. That, that through believing, 
we would see. I don't know where you're at this morning, where your, your faith is, where your belief is. We're going through this book that we may believe. Hopefully it's being increased week by week. So the point of John, God's word doesn't go back void. So that is the point of this book. It will occur that, that our faith would increase, that we would believe and see clearer and clearer what God has for us. This life is a vapor. It will be gone so quick. And that we would use all of it, every breath we have for God's glory. That we would believe, we would start there every day and God would, would reveal himself more and more every day in our life. And that the people that he's placed around us, that we would think again why we are around them. And that we would be faithful to share the good news with them. To share the gospel of Christ. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that, that you are consistent. God, that you are faithful. God, that you are truth, you are the way, you are the life, we can taste and see that you are good, you've called us to do, Lord, to taste and see that you are good. And I pray for the church this morning, I pray for everyone in here, God, I pray that we would believe. God, that we would continue to believe. God, that we would see because we believe. God, we would see what you have for our lives. God, we would see the purpose that you've called us to. God, we would see the gifts that you've given us. God, we would run toward you. God, we would not drift day by day. God, let us be anchored to the truth of your word and your scriptures. God, in this time of worship, God, I pray that we would respond. Lord, as this man in John 9, boom, he believed and he worshiped. God, I pray that we would not be distracted during this time by anything else. God, may we fix our thoughts and our eyes upon you. God, may we respond for whatever you would be calling of us. God, for whoever you would place on our heart that you would want us to step into their life and to be salt and light to them, to share the greatest news that could be shared. God, and in doing that, God, that we would see even clearly, more clearly, in our obedience, Lord, that we would see clearer than we see right now. So, Lord, I thank you for who you are. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to have... Uh, uh, we're going to take tithe and offering... And God loves a cheerful giver. Um, and, and so we know that everything is from God and that we get to give, that His will would be done, His, His kingdom would come on earth as it is in heaven. And so uh, we also have an agape box in the back, back there. And we're going to start doing more of the agape. We're going to actually build a few agape boxes um, just so that we could just focus on worshiping right now. And, and giving is a, a form of worship for sure. Giving is definitely a response. So we have that time right now, but just please give cheerfully. Or if you're visiting or first time, don't feel pressure to give. But if, if the Lord wants you to give, if it's part of worship for you, then <laughs> worship the Lord. And we're also going to have uh, communion come out uh, during worship where you can uh, take that together as a family and just taste that forgiveness that 
It is representative of the broken body of Christ and His blood spilt on the cross. Historical, factual, this happened. God loves you. It's, it's, you can't change history. It's one and done. And so we, we look back to that and we celebrate when our sins were forgiven and, and, and how they were forgiven. So we take communion in light of that. And... Uh, My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, the weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of When darkness seems to hide his face, I'll rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. My anchor holds within the veil. Christ alone, cornerstone, the weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord. When he shall come with trumpet sounds, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless stand before the throne. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, fully stand before the throne. Fully stand before the throne in Christ alone, cornerstone, the weak made strong in the Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of Christ alone, cornerstone.
Invited, invited, invited deep into this mystery. Delighted, delighted by the wonders I have seen. will be my story this will be my song you always be my savior jesus you will always have my heart astounded astounded that your gospel beckoned me surrounded surrounded but I've never been so free astounded 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 that your gospel beckoned me. Surrounded, surrounded, but I've never been so free. This will be my story. will be my song. You will always be my Savior, Jesus. You will always have my heart. Yes, this will be my story. This will be my song. Savior Jesus, you will always have my heart. Determined, determined now to live this life for you. You're so worthy, my greatest gift would be the least you're due. Determined, determined now to live this life for you. You're so worthy. My greatest gift would be the least your due. This will be my 
story. This will be my song. You'll always be my Savior, Jesus. You will always have my heart. This will be my story. Yes, this will be my song. You'll always be my Savior, Jesus. You will always have my heart. I see your face in every sunrise. The colors of the morning are inside your eyes. The world awakens in the light of the day. I look up to the sky and say, you're beautiful. together. Oh, I see your power in the moonlit night where planets are in motion and galaxies are bright. We are amazed in the light of the stars. It's all proclaiming who you are. You're beautiful. Oh, you're beautiful. I see you there hanging on a tree. You bled and then you died and then you rose again for me. Now you are sitting on your heavenly throne. Soon you will be coming home. You're beautiful.
So bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, we worship your holy name. So bless the Lord, oh, my soul, oh, my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, we worship your holy name. Lord, we worship your holy name. God, we worship your holy name. Lord, you are worthy of all worship, Lord. You're worthy of all our lives. And Lord, we're so pleased, Lord, to be witnesses of your beauty, Lord. Lord, from without, Lord, you cover this world, Lord, in a canvas, Lord. And yet you make us your canvas. And you make us beautiful. Lord, we just acknowledge your greatness and your goodness. Here and now, we worship you. We honor you. The great name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Go in the Lord. Walk with him.